<clears throat> this is Giuliana Ranicor-Brees. This is part two of my conversation with uh, the poet, uh, Catherine Smith. Go ahead, Catherine. So, do, do tell me about your early life. So I grew up in Windsor, uh -huh. Berkshire, about 15 miles west of London. Um, it's a very, very odd place to grow up. Really? It has, why, why is that? Because it has the royal family are partly residents there. So I thought that in everywhere had a castle and I thought that every Saturday morning the Coldstream guards went down the high street playing a full, you know, brass band and bagpipes and things. Um, it was an odd place to grow up. Did was, you see the Queen? Uh, yes, yes. I mean, you know, walking her corgis, not maybe? not walking her corgis, sort of doing <laughs> doing official stuff. Yeah, and I yeah. used to I used to drink in a pub called the Two Brewers, which was set into the castle walls, and that was where um, a lot of the royal staff, especially the horse, the, the equerries, the equerries, and but but especially the um, the grooms and the horse people okay. used to drink there as well. So uh, that was a did you hot, talk to them? Hotbed of gossip and scandal. Yes. Oh, scandal. <laughs> well, not really scandal, but did you speak to some of them? Yes, well, they were just there in the pub. So right, they, right. The, the only thing to do in Windsor... They're called lackeys, aren't they? Yeah, something like that. They were they were nice, actually. They were interesting. They were probably more interesting than the people they <laughs> served, actually. And all horse mad. But in Windsor, you can be good at sport or you can be good at kind of underage partying. So I wasn't any good at sport, so... You were was, into the party. I was into the party. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And when did, how old were you when you left I Windsor? I was 18 and I went to study literature and the history of ideas and history at Bradford University in West Yorkshire. History of ideas, can Hist you elaborate yeah, on that? Yeah, history of ideas is intellectual history essentially. So it's looking at, um, if you're looking at literature, if you're looking at something like um, Sartre's Nausea, you look at that in conjunction with the philosophy of existentialism because the idea of a... Um, a course that isn't just you know ploughing one narrow furrow which which most literature courses do most literature courses don't acknowledge what was going on politically uh -huh, scientifically uh -huh, uh -huh. the background artistically at the time um so we studied darwin we studied um the history of science we studied leibniz we studied we studied Hobbes and Kant, we studied, it, it's a kind of philosophy course, but you're looking at the ideas that bring forth the Renaissance and the Reformation, and then you're looking at, you know, what's happening in the art world at the time when Impressionism was happening. Impressionism didn't happen in a vacuum. If you study art history, which I have done for, for A-level as an evening class some years ago. Um, and you're married, in fact, to yeah, someone I'm, who I'm, teaches it. Yes, that's right. He's, well, he's a, an artist. He teaches a bit of art history. Yes. Um, but you would think from, art, from the way art history is taught that nothing else was going on in the rest of the world. And, of course, nothing happens in a vacuum. Right. Impressionism happened because certain political things were happening and certain scientific ideas were coming to the fore and there was a less rigid way of looking at the world. So art, art and music reflect what's going on in the rest of the world. Right. Po politically, you couldn't have had the swinging 60s had you not had certain scientific in, you know, innovations and so forth. Such as what? Well, I'm thinking about the pill. Oh, and yes, so forth. the thinking, pill. Thinking yes, about yes, the way yes. the pill revolutionised women's that's, lives in that's particular. That's true, yes. And then scientific discoveries that allowed Women's people, lib. Yeah, scientific discoveries that allowed people to understand more about diseases and so forth. So uh -huh. it was a wonderful course. It was brilliant. I loved it. Gosh. And I loved living in West Yorkshire, which is about as different from Windsor as you can imagine. Ah, right. Well, Gosh, don't they, they have the Arvon Foundation there, don't they? Not in Bradford. That's yeah. in... Uh, but it's Yorkshire. It's West Yorkshire, yes. Yeah, yes yeah. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know anything about the Arvon Foundation at the time. I'm, I'm sure it was going at the time. Yeah. Like, yes. I, I didn't yes. know anything about it at the time. Gosh. So um, you, you got your degree and then you, you moved to London? Then I moved to London and got a proper job. Um, oh, what does that mean? A proper job? <laughs> you mean nine to five? I do. God forbid. God forbid. Um, so I worked for, I worked in a, 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 a technical and commercial library and information service. At that time, there was a, it was, this was 1980, 1983. 
Okay. And there was a bit of a dip. There was a bit of a recession. So basically, uh-huh. you know, I was grateful to have a job. And I lived in West London and okay. I worked in Southall. And then I worked for um, a very posh estate agent called Savills for two oh, years. Oh, yes, yeah. And I worked in their library and information service with lots of Sloan Rangers. I think, I, was, I think me and the guy from the photocopying room were the only people who hadn't been to public school and didn't wear pearls and stripy blouses, little ruffles. Um, <laughs> and then I worked for a Canadian headhunter and I was a researcher. So I did a lot so, of... So you were basically research, research archive, yeah, yeah. and the computer hadn't come in then? Or it Basic was just coming computing. in? Basic computing, yes, yes. I mean, in order to do research, I used to get on the company bicycle and cycle to the London Library and right, look through right, right. Uh, biographies and look through... Um, so connected books. with books? Yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, the, the subject matter was, was not particularly creative, but it did really hone my research skills, so I'm yes. grateful to it for that. And I'm also, I also think that sometimes you have to find out what you don't want to do in exactly. order to really exactly. connect to what you do want to do. You would have do. probably made an excellent uh, picture researcher for the publishing industry. Well, maybe. I was always quite, I've always been interested in research, and I, yes. and I think yes. one of the things I find now is that I have to really rein in my instinct to research things to death. And yes, just think, me too. You, you have to start writing Absolutely. at some point. Absolutely. Thank, thank God for Google. <laughs> Thank God for Google, which is, is... And Wikipedia. Yeah, which is like an access to all these amazing libraries. But at the same time, three hours later, you can find yourself going, oh, my God, that's interesting. I'll just follow that link. And then thinking, I haven't actually done any... All I've done is is go off at interesting tangents on this research. So I have to rein myself in. I think I'm a natural... I think I'm, a, I'm an instinctive researcher. Yeah, but you can bring it into something that you're yeah, writing at yeah, some other no, point. I, I do think that anything we do in life, nothing's ever wasted. I yeah, do really yeah, believe that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, when did you start becoming professional, um, you know, with poetry and short stories and so on? Yeah, well, I, I wrote as a child. I was a very kind of dreamy, imaginative child. I did you keep a, a journal? Not a journal. I just wrote endless stories. And I had those wonderful books where on the left-hand side it was lined paper and on the right-hand side it was plain paper, which to me was heaven because Mm -hmm. you could write Mm -hmm. a scene in your story and then you could illustrate it. Mm -hmm. I loved drawing Mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I wrote loads and loads of stories. Um, Children's stories? Yes, I suppose because I was a child. I was just writing for myself and writing for my age group. Were your parents into... uh books Not and literature a, they were my both keen both keen for me to be my mum was a very keen reader uh-huh. um, my dad has only recently started reading novels <laughs> though he's always read a lot of non-fiction stuff about aeroplanes which interests him my mum was a prolific voracious right. reader and gave me loads and loads of books to read so she inspired you really. yeah she really really encouraged me in my reading Right, um, right. And I think she wanted me to have all the opportunities that she hadn't had because of the, the war interrupted her education. So she, right, right. although she was very bright and very academic, she didn't yes. go into academia. Yes. Um, because most people didn't at, the, at that time. You know, no. you had to be quite wealthy to go to yes, university yes. at that time. Right. Well, um, I mean, that was the era of being a housewife and, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, she, raising a family. Raising a family. She was a nurse, so uh-huh. she, she went okay. into nursing. Um, so I wrote uh, poetry and short fiction when I was little. I had some published in various uh, national poetry competitions, the Daily Mail Children's Literary Competition, I think oh, as well. Yeah. And then as a teenager, we had some poets coming into my school and I had some poems in a W.H. Smith anthology of angst-ridden teenage poetry, now mercifully out of print. And then I went off and studied literature and the history of ideas at university, and that did stop me writing. It was fascinating, but it ah, really did. Well, we'll talk about all that work. in part three. Thank you very much, Catherine.